Hi, everybody, and welcome to Talk Gnosis. This is Father Tony, and joining me, as always, is the Reverend Deacon Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony, Reverend Subdeacon Jonathan Stewart. It's I do Mel- that all the time. I know. Just remember, yeah. sub, sub. I'll remember, sub, sub. sub. Yeah, that'll that'll come in handy later. Uh, yes. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, today we have a good show. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, some social justice and some liberation theology and some other interesting things. And to help us with that is Nicholas Lachetti. Hello, Nicholas. How are hey. you? Hey, how are you guys? Thanks for having me. Oh, our pleasure. So uh, take it away, Jonathan. Let's jump right in. Yeah, let's get into it. Uh, so, Nicholas, uh, you know, I move in esoteric circles. That's why I do the podcast. And I've heard a lot of uh, work on yourself first. Or uh, we are specifically a Gnostic podcast, so I've heard a lot, you know, the, of the world's a lost cause, right? So you work on your own liberation. So, like, like isn't Western esotericism an elite, self-focused ideology? Like, how, how can it connect to thinking about a wider society? Yeah, um, so, yeah, I think this is probably the biggest question. <laughs> so, so it's kind of the whole, the, the book that I just published, which is called The Inner Church is the Hope of the World, was kind of, an attempt to answer some of that, I think. And primarily, um, yes, it, Western esotericism is definitely an elitist uh, school of thought. It's a, I think it's a pretty, to you, not to sound re- right off the bat too sort of Marxist, but it's very bourgeois in the way that we kind of, that myself and everybody kind of is, is doing it, I think, in the 21st century. I mean, uh, Facebook groups, private societies, um, you know, correspondence courses, especially in the American and North American experience of esotericism. It can be very individualistic, private, um, but esotericism in its roots tends to have utopian aspirations. Um, so historically, all of the major trends in esotericism, and this is kind of in the intro to the book, um, Rosicrucianism especially, has always had a social reform aspect to its thought. Um, and the earliest esotericists that we would consider part of that line of Western esotericism starting in the early modern period so people like Tommaso Campanella, um, Giordano Bruno, uh, Ficino, all these people had uh, an important goal of reforming the society they were in on every level, really. So science, religion, arts, it was a total program of cultural change. Um, so I think it's only in the last 100, 150 years that esotericism has really become this completely individualistic, even consumerist approach. Um, and I think even with your, with your backgrounds in the Gnostic Church, I think Gnosticism was a form of cultural critique and social critique itself. So yeah. the notion that it would be a private kind of just you and your relationship with the divine or something is really a modern, super modern, past hundred years really idea. So I think that's, yeah. that would be my first answer. Um, <laughs> yeah. Great. Now. I've I've heard it argued, particularly online, that the Western esoteric. Well, that's your first mistake, right there. Yeah, so yeah, there we yeah. go. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but I've heard it I've heard it argued in other places too. Um, particularly online. That the Western esoteric tradition that it's inherently right wing and fascist. And we, we have some evidence for this because uh, Steve Bannon, you know, he's a big friend uh, a big fan of the per- perennialists mm-hmm. who draw on a lot of the, the, the esoteric traditions. And uh, a fan of the not- podcast. Hi Steve. Yeah, big fan of the podcast. He's our next guest. You know, we're going to bounce <laughs> okay. off, you know, right? Are going right to be on a panel? Are we going to panel together? That would be, that'd be <laughs> Sure, <great>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be cool. Yeah. Right. There's, there was also the Nazis. Uh, you know, yeah. the, the early Nazi movement uh, was fascinated by the occult, esotericism. We have online Keck magic, which has claimed the esoteric supports yeah. our ideology. What would you say that, that, that the esotericism is inherently right wing, even fascistic? Yeah. Um, so that's interesting because each of those cases, I think we could probably go all day naming an opposite version uh, that that would be that similar people would also say is inherently left wing and Marxist and uh, all these things that are like boogeymen on the right. So, for example, in, in some of the circles that I don't necessarily know that well in person because they really wouldn't like me, but the traditionalist Catholic wing of the Roman Catholic Church, they tend to think everybody who's a Marxist socialist is a left wing uh, Freemason, Rosicrucian person. So there's, I think that the, both sides have generally claimed that esotericism is inherently one extreme political position or the other. And I think you can kind of find, uh, you can kind of catalog both sides. So with Keck magic, you also had the whole uh, Wiccan uh, cursing and uh, hexing Trump phenomenon, uh, 
which here in New York was very popular. There was an entire hipster occult shop in Brooklyn that had an event for that. So, I mean, that's the, the kind of the silliest area, but then, I mean, I don't know, I'll get hexed now because I said that. But then the other areas, I mean, with the Nazis, they killed and um, put many esotericists, Freemasons, Martinists into concentration camps, including OTO members, um, yeah, Martinist or Gnostic Church. So, uh, so like uh, Constant Chevillon, Chevillon, which you might know more about than I, he was shot to death by the Nazis. So it really, I, I think you could catalog it through history and you have right-wing approaches, left-wing approaches. I think for me, more importantly than doing that would be to see if there's a through line through all of this history towards anything uh, that's a, a higher narrative that would go beyond some of this left-right politics that we kind of use in modern North American language. So, and I think what that is, and I think if you go back to the Rosicrucian manifestos and to some of those sources, early Freemasonry, that there has always been this idea of social reform, this kind of utopian reform mentality. Um, whether it's fascistic, I think that it, it's definitely more authoritarian in some ways in even historic historic version of esotericism than some of us might be very comfortable with. Um, for example, but that that you know that critique falls on like the Marxism communism as well frequently. Uh, we can kind of debate about that. So yeah, I, I, do, I don't think there's a esotericism has always been hierarchical. I would say, but I don't think it's inherently fascistic. So. Yeah, I've, I've been thinking a lot about that recently. Um, I I posted a joke uh, joke post I guess a while back about you know like um, you're familiar with the uh, open source order of the Golden Dawn. Yeah, Have you heard? yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I just think that's a fascinating idea, um, and I I wanted to kind of explore what that might look like in a in a um, uh, Martinist framework. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I I kind of put this kind of, you know one page kind of white paper together of what would a an open source order of martinists look like yeah. and uh you know networks of initiations with you know that without hierarchies and everything and everybody i showed it to thought it was so strange that they couldn't wrap their head around it um yeah. which you know just goes to what you were saying that these concepts are you know were developed in a time when this kind of hierarchy would have been just the default and yeah. Yeah. The, there was there was no other way of conceptualizing doing these things in the you know kind of formalized western tradition of course in the mm -hmm. kind of folk magic tradition it's a, it's a whole mm -hmm. different kind of um mm -hmm. approach and it's it's very non-hierarchical and very you know teacher students uh mm -hmm. kind of thing and then even in martinism though i'm surprised some people I don't know, maybe it was the open source language, but I, I would say being somewhat familiar with Martinism and the Golden Dawn that the Martinist order is already a lot kind of more horizontal in some ways than... than it is, it's more, yeah. yeah, than a lot yeah. of them, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. But there's always this kind of um, emphasis on lineage. Yeah, I mean, lineage. We've talked about Martinism a, a number of times on this show, and, and lineage is always a big part of that conversation. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. so I don't think you can take that away from Martinism and still mm -hmm. call it Martinism. I think that's one of the landmarks, I guess, if you want to use that language. But uh, Yeah, yeah. But it is mm -hmm. interesting that, that mm -hmm. um, taking away the lodge model <laughs> is a, yeah, the lodge model. Is a yeah. stumbling block for a lot of people. And the interesting thing, just sorry to go ramble on about no, this, this, this aspect, yeah. One yeah. of the, th this is a this... podcast for rambling about awesome ass. <laughs> yeah. So, no, so this, this idea of network versus hierarchy, which I think has been coming up in some conversations online recently in groups that John and I are part of. And then um, in my work, there's been this emphasis on the idea of net war and new politics, like politics and the mental terrain and all this stuff. And networks are going up against hierarchies. But I think in Western esotericism, like in Freemasonry and Martinism, both um, they are hierarchical inherently with degree, the degree system in the lodges, but the lodges were some of the earliest democratic networks in some ways. They really mm -hmm. organized outside of established churches, um, uh, organized people from you know higher walks of life and uh, poor and dispossessed people. So it's, there's always been like a pull in Freemasonry and Martinism as well as an extension of it to some extent um, between this network and hierarchy model, I think. So. There's still some of that in Freemasonry, though. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, maybe at one point it was less formal. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, the, there are um, 
speaking as a mason there are very strict hierarchies within yeah. <laughs> freemasonry yeah. and and while those hierarchies are democratic um you know they they do change up a lot there's um there's some inertia built in i yeah. think yeah so, uh, Nicholas, you move in both esoteric and, and mainline Christian circles. Like, we didn't mention what you do for a living or, or where you went to school, so if you want yeah. to bring that up. But uh, I'm just wondering about the, the interactions between the two, because they often seem to be to be split apart, segregated. So, uh, and, and I know, of course, this is, this is a big theme in your book, um, and uh, this is, of course, a question that we could probably have an entire podcast series about, but, uh, but two questions. The, the, the first, the big one, what, what does esoteric Christianity have to offer to the mainline church? And the second okay. question is because you move between these, these mainline and esoteric circles, like the people at your work in your former school, like how, how do, what's their reaction to, to, to your practice, uh, practice of esotericism? Yeah. <laughs> do they think you're like a weird heretic or something? Um, I, yeah, I think they do. Yeah. <laughs> I guess of the heretic more of the weird part. So yeah. just to give some of the background. So I, I, I um, am, yeah, I come from kind of the mainline Christian world in some way. Um, so I went to seminary at Union Theological Seminary in New York City, uh, which is a pretty historic mainline liberal Protestant seminary. I'm actually a Roman Catholic in my own background. Um, but the Union Seminary is filled with Unitarians, Presbyterians, Lutherans, it's, it's pretty much the kind of a collection of liberal uh, mainline Protestants um, and kind of the most progressive uh, seminary in the country, really, and the birthplace of a lot of liberation theology in the North American context. Um, and I actually work at the seminary now for something called the Cairo Center, uh, which is called the Cairo Center, uh, the Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice. Um, and a lot of our work is specifically in organizing grassroots movements around the country, specifically to end poverty. Um, but more recently, we've worked on um, a movement called the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, uh, which was led by a pastor out of North Carolina, Reverend William Barber, and the Kairos co-director, Reverend Liz Theo Harris. So um, yeah, so that world of kind of social justice, liberal Protestantism, uh, that's the kind of seminary world, and then more of the esoteric stuff I do they don't really know each other that well. <laughs> that's the thing that, that's been kind of the interesting thing for me. Um, Union is really interested in a lot of different approaches to social justice and mysticism. So, for example, they just started an engaged Buddhism uh, minor, I think, where you can study Buddhism and social change. But their own traditions of Western Christianity, um, Gnosticism, uh, you know, esoteric ideas, occultism, they, those are things that they wouldn't really study at Union. Um, it tends to be a... Eastern religion or Hinduism, Buddhism, and that way you can kind of study mysticism and bring some of that in. But I think the Western traditions are just not something that's been brought into those contexts. Um, and I think there's cultural reasons for that. I think this is an exoticism of the kind of Eastern approaches. Um, but what I think plus that, you can talk about those without necessarily talking about the heresies, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> historically that's been the problem too. So yeah. Uh, yeah, because Christianity. So Union in Union's interesting situation in that because it was a Presbyterian seminary originally in the 19th century, um, and it was actually tried for heresy in the late 19th century and ejected from the Presbyterian Church for uh, liberal Bible interpretation. So they didn't take the Bible literally, <laughs> things like that. So you'd think they'd be okay with that kind of tradition. And we do study what we call Gnostic or non-canonical um, New Testament era texts at Union. I've done some of that. But the notion that any of that continued on more, more than just a historical curiosity through in a tradition in or a lineage to the modern era is really not something that's been discussed. Um, yeah, and I think that esotericism has a lot to offer uh, the main lines because I think one of the things that mainline Christianity has really lost track of is any kind of mystical sense of its own religion to some extent so the thing mm -hmm. at union that really frustrated me was i really do adhere to a lot of the i mean as you can see from the book the liberation theology i mean i'm pretty rooted in that but at the same time the lack of any kind of mystical or what they would think is more of a superstitious approach to uh, religion or um or any of those ritual practices is really not something that is at union and it's a very post-enlightenment post-kantian setting so the fact that there's just kind of a third way, you're, you're not necessarily either a fundamentalist Christian or a um, like sort of atheistic post-enlightenment person. You could actually be part of this tradition that's bringing in science and religion and esotericism. That's really 
they just don't know about it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, this is a big one, uh, another big one. Uh, but uh, can you do your best to explain what what is liberation theology? <laughs> so that's a funny question because um, uh, my wife Lily actually also is now a Union seminarian, and but I met her before she started at Union, and she hung out with because she comes from a mainline Protestant tradition. She kept hearing people say liberation theology, and myself and my roommate at the time kept saying liberation theology, this or that. And eventually she was like, so what exactly is that? <laughs> which which was sort of sad on some level because it really means that liberation theology hasn't in any way seeped into an especially North American consciousness about what Christianity could be. Uh, but liberation theology is a tradition, um, primarily I would say left-wing or progressive within the Christian church that started in Latin America mostly. Um, and it's a tradition of... I would not say it's Marxist, though some conservatives would. I would say it's brought in some Marxian critiques and sort of social democratic critiques of uh, society and sort of found them rooted in the Bible and what Jesus' words. Um, and the, the really the central core idea is that the God of the Bible is actually a God of liberation. Uh, so especially in black liberation theology, for example, the Exodus story is read as an example of God's liberating impulse for the people, that God always... Uh, takes people out of slavery, out of oppression, uh, is trying to free people from those powers and principalities that are oppressive, um, and then that God is aligned with the poor and the oppressed in the world. So right. the, most of the branches of it were in Latin America, and then in North America in the 70s and 80s, uh, black liberation theology, feminist theology, queer theology, all of these kinds of theologies started to develop at the same time the academy was kind of moving in that kind of postmodern turn to some of these identity politics a lot a slew of liberation theologies also started to emerge um so union seminary where i work and went to school is, is very much rooted in in that tradition um so yeah the idea of the book was kind of to say well actually there's been themes like this in esotericism not quite worded in that way a very different kind of in terminology but also to see uh religion and the mystical tradition as actually taking people out of oppression uh, reforming society so yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and gnosticism is all about liberation as well yeah, yeah. i i yeah. think that i you know i might creep into the next question here but uh yeah. the the, <laughs> the idea of the idea of being imprisoned and uh -huh. and requiring liberation is so central to the gnostic theology that yeah. you know that i think that i think that's why it's <clears throat> so comfortable in in the christian context you know you you, you look at um where Gnosticism likely came from, it was largely Jewish, um, but because of the uh, you know kind of uh, liberation themes that in the New Testament, that I, I think that it it just fits right in so well with the things that Jesus was saying that um, you know that it makes a lot of sense. So anyway, let's let's do talk a little bit about that. So we talk a lot about obviously Gnosticism and stuff on this show, and and. Um, We've been we've had a number of shows lately about the archons and the demiurge and yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, what's your uh, what's your hot take on that? Uh, so it, interesting. So the archons, I, I never hear it spoken of that way in sort of the mainline circles. But mm -hmm. there is an understanding of the powers and principalities, um, mm -hmm. which is a biblical concept. So it says in the letters of Saint Paul, uh, we strive not against flesh and blood, but against the cosmic powers of this present darkness. So there's all this stuff about uh, powers and principalities ruling the world, basically, mm -hmm. and that Christians through the blood of Christ or uh, whatever your understanding of that sort of liberation is, that you're actually taken out of those oppressive structures. Um, and I would say that there's a long tradition in more radical Christian thought that would be aligned with liberation theology um, about powers and principalities. Uh, and one of the interesting things I found when I was writing the book is that um, William Stringfellow, who is an Episcopal theologian uh, in around the middle of the 20th century, one of my favorite theologians in a more mainstream kind of Christian world, um, he was actually a theologian about the powers and principalities, and he saw them not just as kind of demons in the sky or something like that, but he saw them as social structures, which mm -hmm. I think is really similar to the ancient Gnostics in a lot of ways. So uh, images, ideologies, and institutions were all powers and principalities. And that, and his vision of Christianity was that Christ was a liberator who would liberate you from those structures so that you could resist them. 
And the interesting thing about Stringfell is he never spoke about anything esoteric or Gnostic. I think he would find it totally beyond the, pot, the, beyond the pale. But then another theologian, Walter Wink, who I think is a little bit better known, uh, drew heavily on Stringfell. Walter Wink's been popular, I think, with some sci-fi writers. Um, a lot. It, Wink's gotten into our culture a little more. But he wrote a trilogy about the powers, and he also wrote a side book called Cracking the Gnostic Code, which is actually, as far as I know, one of the only books by a mainline Christian theologian who actually takes Gnostic texts and thinks about them theologically. So while I didn't really do that in this book, it was definitely a model in the sense of saying these are texts that the mainline tradition thinks of as kind of heretical or outside the canon, but it, what is the theological truth that you can find here? And what Wink found is really powers and principalities or the archines that the Gnostics would say are the interiorities of, or the angels of nations or images or ideologies like fascism, for example, isms tend to have a power attached or a nation has a power attached or even your, like in esotericism, we would talk more personally about your ego or something. There's kind of the social structures or personality structures you've created for yourself. Those have powers attached. And that real, real theology, liberation theology is a way to free yourself from those structures. So yeah, I think there's a pretty basic connection between some of those Gnostic ideas and some of this modern liberation theology. And the thing that's not really that surprising about it is Marx was, Marx who has seen in the background of some of this liberation theology was pretty religious in lots of ways. His entire kind of method of sociology and that kind of mid 19th century socialist, radical socialist stuff was really drawing on a longer term religious tradition, um, aligning itself with kind of heretical religion. So there's a whole eschatology built in. So the fact that you can, if you go back enough, you can find all those parallels. It's not really that surprising, I think. Yeah. Mm. Let's talk about your book for a minute. What um, what text did you draw from to yeah. talk about these ideas? Um, so I, I have a, a copy next to me. I feel like the index gets all over the place. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I would say, so my the most influential theologian for me uh, in the Christian world is named Edward Skillebex, who is like another in mid 20th century Roman Catholic theologian. And um, I did some of my work in seminary on Skillebex. And his main theological insight was essentially that um, anytime human beings erupt in struggle in some way, whenever their rights are being trampled upon, that God is in that struggle uh, for the, on the one hand, and also that all of that is an attempt at expressing a truth about what humanity is supposed to look like in the future, the ideal humanity or he calls it the humanum, but I think in esotericism we might call it uh, the cosmic Christ or Adam Cadman, something like that. Um, that this is all of these types, all of these examples of humans erupting in struggle. Um, I would also add to it humans creating their own sources of religious meaning. So even you know New Age traditions, occultism, whatever, any kind of religious attempt at finding meaning in the world rather than the world being meaningless and doomed, are attempts at human beings at kind of expressing this future humanity. So I would say that kind of core insight went into all the reflections in the book and hopefully bring them together to some extent. And then in terms of esotericism, I would say the social Kabbalah section has a lot uh, of influence from the Golden Dawn because the Golden Dawn tradition in its offshoots was a big uh, kind of influence on me since I got into esotericism. Um, and then another thing I would mention is um, Eliphas Levy, who really is the founder of occultism as we know it in a lot of ways. And himself was um, a radical socialist and um, also a Catholic in some way. And he tried, and that seems strange to a lot of people now, but his idea of what Kabbalah and what occultism is was connected to his idea of what true religion is and what true socialism was. And there's actually modern scholars like Julian Strube in Europe now who are doing a lot of work on trying to uh, talk about Levy's roots in all those traditions. So I think mm. all of that stuff kind of went into the background and the construction of the book. Yeah, that actually leads to my next question, because uh, you just mentioned it. Now, I've heard of the Kabbalah before, and chances are most of our listeners have. But what, what is the social Kabbalah? Well, I mean, I, as far as I know, I made that up. <laughs> so it's something <laughs> that I made up. But So what I was doing when I wrote that chapter, which I think really is the heart of the book, and most of the rest of it is just kind of reflections on pieces of it, um, is this idea in Kabbalah, as most of the listeners to the show know, is that um, in Western esotericism, there's a correspondence between the different levels of reality. And I would say that's really the core esoteric insight that's pretty much in every form of Western esotericism. So in Kabbalah, in the Tree of Life, we tend to think of it 
as our body or our uh, psychology, I and mean, especially Israel Vigardi, who kind of introduced that psychological model of magic. Everything is kind of about your your own inner, internal psychology and how to resolve that in kind of the Jungian idea. Um, but we can easily think of our bodies and our minds as reflecting the cosmos. That's something esotericists love to do. But right. there's also a middle level of society. And human society as a construct in its social structures, like we're saying, these powers and principalities that are institutions in our society, those also are a level of reality. So what I was trying to do there is to say, well, and as far as I could tell, there's not much been done on this in es esoteric versions of Kabbalah, is that you, you not only do you have to have a Kabbalistic analysis of the bo human body and the human mind, but you need one of the human society, and that, that has to mirror the cosmic process as well. And if you take that kind of inner insight from liberation theology, but I also think from Gnosticism and esotericism that God is going to liberate uh, people from these oppressive structures and eventually that we are going to find that kind of peaceable kingdom with God, um, then that Kabbalistic process in society has to also kind of have that, that sort of telos. It has to move in a direction of liberation as well. So that, that's kind of the core insight in there, I think. Okay, very cool. Can so, you give us? Uh, sorry, Jonathan. Um, I, th I find that interesting. Can you give us some examples of um, uh, some kind of cabalistic correspondences in, on a social level? Yeah. So I think um, one of so one of the main ones, for example, um, if you look through the book, I think so. Malkut, for example, I think we would take it as this lowest level material world or something. And the book I talk a bit talk about it as kind of the the city. This is kind of the teeming city, um, or a late capitalist city in some ways, where you have, you know, if you try to picture like a loud, like marketplace or something, you know, that's that's kind of the lowest level where everything's kind of become jostled and mixed up, all the influences of the rest of the tree, which is all these parts of society. And then as you move up, I tried to kind of separate it out into these different social spheres. So Yasad was probably the easiest because it already more or less resembles popular culture. So it's the subconscious, mm -hmm. it's kind of the popular culture being the subconscious level of our society. Uh, all these images, memes, things that are kind of popping up online, all that stuff. And that's the realm we tend to live in a lot, which is interesting uh, in our contemporary culture. But then um, if you keep moving up, you have uh, the civic bureaucracy, which I put into Hod. And I put that into Hod because it's, it's kind of a rational ordering principle. Um, in some ways, it, it's a social democracy, like how do you understand a government's responsibilities? And then Netzach, I actually put the marketplace. And that seemed a little strange at first, but it's a realm of desires in a lot of ways. Um, what people think that they want, uh, what they want uh, what they want to buy in some ways. Um, and you have those two. And I tried to keep it, as you go up the tree in this chapter, uh, all the social spheres that I've assigned to the spheres of the tree of life kind of balance in some way. Uh, which uh, being the key insight, I think, of the, the Tree of Life. So the idea with like Hod and Netzach is that the marketplace and a kind of civic bureaucracy that understands regulate like proper regulations or, in some sense, planning, they have to be balanced. So, like if you have too strong on one side of like a civic bureaucracy, for example, you get something like a Stalinist dictatorship. If you have too yeah. much of a kind of, I mean, I know some people might be libertarians, but I'm not. So if you have too much Netzach, the marketplace is ruling everything, you have a total kind of free enterprise, no sense of kind of social commonwealth. And then in the uh, going higher up, Tifereth, which is really the heart center, becomes the common wheel or the commonwealth of the society. So the sense of a greater purpose or greater good to society or um, a feeling of connection to our fellow citizens that we have uh, responsibilities and duties to them. So the idea is kind of, as in traditional Golden Dawn ideas of the tree after the fall, um, being out of line with Tifereth means you're really out of line with the higher self of a society. Mm -hmm. And that's, so that's kind of the image of the fall as a social fall, which, again, is kind of a liberation theology perspective, that the fall is really social as well as personal. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, let's, uh, <laughs> let's move on to something uh, non-controversial. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You see an awful lot of uh, gender symbolism in esotericism oh, generally. Yeah. It's not. Um, in movies. It's not. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, we talk about uh, you know marriage and syzygies yeah. and all kinds of things. 
Um, yeah, so this is a bit heteronormative, generally speaking. And and uh, um, what uh, wh- what does this stuff have to offer people uh, in the queer community? Um, so yeah, that's an interesting question. I think that people that are probably there's probably a lot of people that would be better able to answer this than me. <laughs> I could do my best in, to some extent. I think also that uh, some of our kind of brothers and sisters who are in Wicca and other kind of traditions probably have grappled with this a lot better than people in Western esotericism and mm. occult traditions who have not done much thinking about this yet, <laughs> I would say. So I think they probably will have to soon. Um, but, and you see it's a little bit like in the recent thing in, in the, in the Grand Lodge of England, this whole issue yep. with transgender um, women being allowed to remain in, in lodges if they've transitioned. So there's a lot of, this is going on all over. Um, what I would say is that, uh, much like these other powers and principalities that exist in the world, that um, some of these structures of gender are not necessarily inherent in us, but are actually um, part of the, these social structures. They're constructed, which does not mean that they're not in nature, though, in some way. So I would say that one of the core insights of a lot of occultists, like I'm thinking of Josephine Peladon, is that really androgyny is more of an ideal than um, one or the other gender. And that, that androgynous state, Adam Kadmon being androgynous, is actually something we would aspire to eschatologically. And that we actually, as all people, have to have both of those things, that, that whatever those polarities of male and female, uh, we have to develop them within us if we're lacking one or the other side. So in that way, there's just as much, I think, imagery in esoteric history to do a pretty thorough queer or gender queer reading of this stuff, too. Uh, I just don't think that it's been done. <laughs> so, and yeah. I think that some of the stuff like like OTO sex magic, things like that, are very. Um, they I mean, they're written from a, such a male centric perspective. So you get interesting things like the OTO, the Gnostic Mass, really being a male dominated kind of liturgy. But then you have some people in OTO, which is, I mean, very much part of modern counterculture. And I know a lot of queer and feminist people in OTO, but they a lot of a lot of the line that's been used is like, well you can write a version of that that would be for other genders. We just haven't done it. So I think that it just hasn't been done yet to some extent. So yeah, and there's a lot. Um, and I think that that's interesting because the other thing in esotericism with that is images of the feminine have always been very important, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't necessarily say that balances this out because they're usually so idealized to not really connect necessarily to reality. So there's still a lot that needs to be done in that way. Um, but yeah, I think I, I don't, I, for myself, I think uh, sexuality is something that I've done a lot more work in in more mainstream Christian theology, surprisingly, where it's just as controversial. <laughs> um, but it would be interesting to bring it more into some of this analysis. Yeah. 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 If any of our listeners or viewers have done any work in that area, <laughs> let us know in the comments. <laughs> yeah, please. It's, uh, it is something I actually I think a lot about in, in relation to, to, uh, to Gnosticism as well. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, please get in touch if you're out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there's a, a lot of, um, you know, problematic stuff in Gnosticism that comes up when you talk about, you know, inevitably when you talk about the Gospel of Thomas, you know, you get, yeah. to, the, you get to the end of it and all of a sudden it's like, well, women aren't worthy of life. Well, okay. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> yeah. that was a surprise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. I, yeah. I would say, oh, sorry, but I would say the closest in the book is there's a chapter called City of the Silver Star, which um, brings in some things, some movements in either politics, uh, sort of social movements, and in occultism, I think, speak to um, kind of this developing new humanity that we need to, uh, to we need to be evolving into um, in order to go along with having a new society. And uh, a couple of the influences there, so for example, the Zeno Feminist Manifesto, which I recommend people checking out, is a really interesting kind of contemporary uh, feminist idea that's pretty radical, and it's like kind of a sci-fi era, uh, kind of like, I don't know, it's half glam rock, half sci-fi, <laughs> uh, kind of pulpy modern feminist manifesto that I think people would really enjoy. And then the other thing is, even in places, in, in traditions like Thelema, which are very male-dominated in some ways, there's stuff like the Ma'at tradition, which is appears in the book to some extent. So, um, so for example, the Nima and the Horus Ma'at Lodge, which has a kind of Ma'atian counterbalance to Horus in the Thelemite tradition. So, yeah, there's people that are kind of developing these things, but they they haven't. I don't think they've. This has become the a main question in Western esoteric circles yet, which are 
might be kind of very male dominated still in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. here we are three white yeah, dudes. I mean, yeah. Talking about, talking about <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Well, what are you going to do? <laughs> Jonathan, I have no idea what this next question is about. Oh yeah. Well, it's a, uh, it's a reference to the book. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, but Nicholas will explain it to us. So I'll ask it. Um, Nicholas, what does Martin Luther King Jr. have to do with the Knights Templar? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Okay, so yeah, there's a whole section. I was like, that, I was worried about putting it in the book because it's already a weird book, and <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but so the the reason for that is Martin Luther King is actually a pretty huge influence on the book, not really because of, uh, not not purposefully because of me just wanting to write about Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King, but because um, the work that I do professionally, the Poor People's Campaign is actually a revival of Martin Luther King's final campaign. So what Dr. King was working on in the last year of his life, 1968, when he was assassinated, was actually this thing called the Poor People's Campaign, which was an attempt to bring people together who are living in poverty in this country across all these different lines of difference. So he was really moving away from um, purely civil rights era kind of work and moving towards human rights as a new model. Um, and the Poor People's Campaign was supposed to bring together poor Appalachian and white people, uh, black people in the South and in the northern cities, Native Americans, um, and they were all going to converge on Washington for this uh, tent city encampment that ended up being called Resurrection City. And that did happen, but Martin Luther King was killed in, during the planning of that process. So the Poor People's Campaign was frequently remembered as kind of stalled or a little bit of a failure, though that's really debatable. So the work that I do uh, at Union for the Cairo Center is a revival of, of that vision of the Poor People's Campaign. Um, so I was really enmeshed in that work and that vision while writing the book because that's my full time, my actual job. Um, so and w one of the things I realized is that Martin Luther King uses this image of a nonviolent army of the poor. He keeps talking about it. So he talks about the Freedom Church of the Poor, the nonviolent army of the poor. These are people that are poor and oppressed uh, coming together um, to create this new and unsettling force that can change the unjust structures of our society. And that was really his vision for the campaign. Um, so while I was writing this book, I was also reading all this stuff about like spiritual chivalry, uh, kind of Masonic Knights Templar, like all these different traditions of uh, esoteric chivalry. And one of the things I noticed is that a very similar thing happens in Dr. King's use of a ar nonviolent army and the kind of esoteric use of some of these chivalric orders, which is a spiritualization of uh, what is essentially a military image. And not only that, but that the, the connection becomes that chivalry inherently has action to do in the world. So unlike yeah. sort of a monastic order where you might withdraw from the world, in a chivalric order, you're actually, you pledge to protect the, the poor, the orphan, the widow. You're actually going out into the world. And Martin Luther King, use of that mem uh, metaphor even though he, as we all know, he was very nonviolent, he was uh, dedicated to Gandhian nonviolence, he still used a military metaphor because of the sense of a group of people organizing together to take on these structures, which I see in a chivalric order as well. So that kind of became the basis of that comparison. Um, as I delved into it, I found some interesting things, which is that Martin Luther King actually uses the inner church metaphor frequently. Uh -huh. So the, the the title of the book, The Inner Church is the Hope of the World, which might sound like one of the more esoteric parts of the book, is actually a quote from Martin Luther King. So he himself said in the letter from Birmingham jail, uh, perhaps I must turn my faith to the inner spiritual church, the church within the church as the true ecclesia and the hope of the world. So that idea of the inner spiritual church was actually a part of his work. And that is because he's from a black pietist tradition that actually has similar roots to the Rosicrucians, the German pietists. So he used the inner church for people in the world who are dedicated to this vision of justice. Um, and we in esoteric circles tend to use the inner church to be, you know, we've been transformed internally. Um, we're connected on this deeper level than an institutional church. But really those two things, I think, can dovetail together. So people who are transformed are also a part of this broader movement for justice in, in our social structures. Yes. Excellent. Okay, Father, we're we're getting to the end of our of our formal questions. Mm -hmm. um, do you do you have uh, do you have anything else that, that that's that's bubbled up? <laughs> I've been kind of asking it throughout. I've been making a couple of notes here of things that I want to uh, dive into a little deeper, but uh, yeah, maybe 
maybe we'll have a, a part two of this uh, further down the road. <laughs> OMG, but, uh, yeah, we should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, why don't you go ahead and ask your final question here, and then we will tell people how they can participate in this conversation and, uh, and exactly. keep the conversation going. Exactly. Uh, well, actually, I know we're going to do plugs at, at the end, but uh, I've read the book. Um, I've, I've already loaned it out and bought a copy for a friend. Oh, really? I, I highly recommend it. Um, and uh, Nicholas, I think it's it's probably the most important book on esotericism, at least in this decade, I would say. So, oh, um, yeah, so it's uh, it's a profoundly important book. Um, it's easy to get. Another great thing about the book is is you're going into very deep uh, complex, profound ideas, but the book is relatively short, yeah, which is why short. I've been pushing it on people. Yeah, right? yeah. Usually, esoteric tomes—they're not known for their for their brevity. I, I wrote a lot of it on trains and planes. So, yeah. I mean, like I was saying, I was in the middle of part of the organizing of this campaign, which um, pretty much took me—I was less so now, but was traveling practically every weekend for the first half of this year and and the last half of last year. So, yeah, I wrote the book in the middle of actively doing that kind of social justice organizing work um and i think it reflects that which is that it, writing like one chapter became a much longer process than i had anticipated so yeah so hopefully the brevity works in its favor in that way <laughs> yeah. yeah so so our closing question our new our new fun closing question is uh what's one piece of occult or esoteric art anything modern ancient it could be a book a song a movie a comic book really anything at all that that knocks your socks off so i so i have my own personal answer and i actually had a thought about this that i wanted to bring up because i think you should do a show on it but um so my favorite comic book is hellblazer mm-hmm. so I'm, i know like practically probably everybody who watches the show likes hellblazer but and i was thinking about it when i read the question i was like actually this relates somewhat to this because i think i read hellblazer starting in high school and it was written in, it started to be written in that kind of Margaret Thatcher era England kind of milieu. So this stuff about the archives and the powers and principalities of the society, you can see it kind of haunting that book. I mean, Hellblazer as a comic. Um, and John Constantine's always kind of fighting against that in his kind of anarchist way. So that's always been my favorite that has occult themes. But And that, that led me to thinking a lot about film noir and like kind of hard-boiled detective stuff in general, yep. which really feels Gnostic to me in, in, <laughs> in its overall thing. Like, the world's kind of a pretty bad place, dark place in those kind of perspectives, and Hellblazer, too. Yes. Um, but they're, the hero is always on some sort of quest, you know, yeah. to try to find, like, and it's usually, like, a beautiful woman involved, which has this whole Sophia motif in there. So there's this, and there's, like, you know, there's organized crime or something, and there's, like, the powers. So that's that's been, so that question got me thinking about that. But, yeah, Hellblazer... And that whole Vertigo comics kind of period of like sort of horror noir stuff in the late eighties and early nineties has been, I think, probably what got me into this stuff. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. So, oh, awesome! Yeah, that's well, well, two great, yeah. two great recommendations. And yeah, I never really yeah. thought of film noir as 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 gnostic, but I really yeah. see your point. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah, should do a show. On. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who <laughs> who's an expert in noir and gnosticism, but yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, we talk about um, <clears throat> the. Uh, God, now what's the name of that movie? That um... Dark City. Yep, thank you. Dark City, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dark That's City is, you know, it's a, a very gnostic, overtly gnostic movie, and b pretty noir in its, yeah. uh, in its, yeah. in its effect. So, uh, <clears throat> anyway, so the uh, the book is the Inner Church is the Hope of the World. You can buy it. I'm, I'm assuming on Amazon and where fine books are sold. <laughs> um, where can people find you online if they want to get in touch with you and have strongly worded opinions? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so my blog is called The Light Invisible. So you can find it at thelightinvisible.org. Uh, it also has a Facebook page. And then I have a Twitter, which is uh, NJ Lachetti. So if you want to tweet at me, that may, that would be fine too. <laughs> <laughs> do people still do that? People, uh, I, I tweet for work. So I oh okay. Yeah. So I don't like my own Twitter. I don't really use it. But if people want to send me strongly worded tweets, that's, that's, that's... <laughs> all right. Well, fantastic. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, uh, thank you I so much. get a lot of food for thought there, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna pick up the book and um, I'll have many questions. I'm sure. <laughs> Good. I'll be happy to answer them. All right. And for those of you who are listening and watching along at home. 
Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, uh, subscribe to our podcast on the various places where podcasts get subscribed to. But you can also uh, join in the conversation with us on our Facebook group, The Gnostic Elite. Uh, you just search for The Gnostic Elite on Facebook and you will come across our group. And uh, we will be talking about this episode and future episodes. We've already had some really great conversations over there. We'd love to see you there. And finally, last but not least, if you like what we're doing here on this show and you'd like to support us, we have a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Gnostic. Very easy to remember. You can go over there and check out our newly revised uh, reward structure. So um, if you want to join us for our monthly Drunk Gnosis chats or if you want to... Uh, Get in our private uh, uh, chat channel on Discord. Um, you can do that, and we've got all kinds of interesting stuff set up there. Yeah, so, and it, it, this little is a dollar a month, right? Like yeah. the Patreon, Patreon. Well, a dollar a show. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah. we're doing by, by show yeah. um, just because, you know, there have been a couple of months there where we didn't do anything, and I would feel pretty bad if we were <laughs> yeah. charging people for nothing. So we do it per show we release, so that's, that's uh, how we do that anyway. So um, everybody's already tuned out by now, but uh, <laughs> at any rate, uh, no, this is the best part of the show. It thanks. really is. <laughs> yeah. 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 This is good stuff. All the plugs. Anyway, thanks yeah. once again, Nicholas, for joining yeah. us. Thank you. It was a great conversation, <laughs> and we look forward to speaking to you some more. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, and for everybody else, have a good time. Uh, whatever. See you next time. Whatever see we say time. here at the end. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> bye.